Greetings and welcome to what I think is going to be an awesome conversation uh, about fathers and mental health. Um, as you guys have probably seen across the country, as you've seen locally, um, many, many, many people are struggling with emotional stress, um, anxiety, depression, but there's a unique population that deals with it in many ways in silence, and that's fathers, men, and in some cases, boys. And so today we want to talk about how this affects fathers. And so we have three amazing men who have their own stories that I want to start with introductions. So I'll go Darrell, Dion, and then Joseph. So introduce yourselves in the way that you want to be introduced. Start with you, Darrell. Uh, how you doing? I'm Darrell Lyons. I am a father to a young queen, uh, 15 years old, a young king, nine years old, and it only gets better. Hey, y'all. I'm Dion Chavis, family engagement educator, husband to Aisha, a father of Maceo and Nyla. I have an 18-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son who is on the autism, autism spectrum, and I'm glad to be here. Hey, and I'm Joseph. I'm a father of four ages from three all the way to 15. So things are always fun and interesting here. <laughs> so if you can, as we get to this conversation, I'll just ask the audience to feel free to make notes or drop questions in the chat box. I really wanted to just start off with before we got into the space where Kevin Love and, you know, Steph Curry, LeBron James have talked about mental health. When you were a kid growing up, if you heard that a guy had mental health challenges, what was the perception either from you or from people that you knew? Start with you, Joseph. Back in the day, when you heard that somebody had mental health challenges, what was the perception? Oh, man. Uh, back for me, the the reference that everybody kind of automatically went to was uh, like shell shock, World War II veterans. Uh, or from that generation, because there there was some in our community that would just wander around and, you know, were facing a lot of challenges. And, you know, when you were called that you had it or called crazy or this or that, that was always like the point of reference whenever you talk about something or you're struggling in that regard. It, it had real negative connotations growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Dion? When you grew up, you were hearing about guys who were not feeling like themselves. You know, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. some emotional challenges. What was the perception? Well, you know, I think for me, man, growing up in in the 80s and the 90s, it wasn't something that was talked about. Mm -hmm. Right. Specifically for men. Um, the only person that I can think of who, you know, I might have known that openly struggled with mental health was uh, just a guy that was a friend of my family. And um you know, they will say that, that that's crazy, such and such. Darrell, how about you? And, and where'd you grow up? Um, I'm originally from a small town called Wichita Falls, Texas. So small town in North Texas. Anybody, you know, I'm a, I'm an 80s baby myself. So anybody who had mental health issues growing up, we thought it was dope. We thought it was drugs. You know, 80s baby, black community, crack epidemic uh -huh. and a monster was created. You know what I mean? So if anybody wasn't right, then they would own something or have a history of being on something and trying to come up out of it. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, your grandparents say, normally if you would see somebody who wasn't quite right per se, uh -huh. they would they would be well enough to carry a Bible. Uh -huh. And that's what my grandmother would say. My grandmother would say, yeah, he ain't got much. They say he ain't got much sense, but he got sense enough to carry that Bible. Yeah. And everything <laughs> would be, but everything yeah. would be okay after that. And then it'll be, you know, something dealing with, um, you need to take your medication. He right. off his meds, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. And so, yeah. and that's the way people will handle it. You know, he, he, mm -hmm. he needs to take his meds. He needs mm -hmm. drugs, not mm -hmm. necessarily illegal street drugs, but, mm -hmm. you know, take your medication that was prescribed to you by your doctor mm -hmm. that, you know, people went to go see for mental health issues, but there was no actual, you know, dealing with it in the sense of, there, there was no sense of empathy. I think that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. There mm -hmm. wasn't as much of a sense of empathy as either he owned something or he needs to get some medication and we'll just go throw a bunch of medicine at it, illegal and legal drugs. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So on the subject of, of mental health, uh, Dion, I'm going to come to you. 
we've all talked about our own experiences with, you know, overcoming emotional or mental health challenges. Um, how did you know? How did you know this ain't right? Something, something, something ain't right. How did you know? Yeah. For, for me, I think I was not feeling um, like myself for a very long period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think finally I got to a point where I just got tired of feeling that way. I got tired of not being not being able to function the way that I thought I should be functioning, right? Like not being able to get out of bed and start my day or not being able to not get agitated or not being able to uh, go an extended period of time without feeling blue. And um, I just decided it was it was time for me to get some help because I knew I couldn't um, I couldn't deal with it alone. I knew it was something that was was kind of bigger than me. I knew it was something that I would need to get some help for. So um, I just decided to 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 let my wife know and to let, um, you know, myself know really that it was time to to really start figuring things out and figuring out why I was feeling this way, why I was um, just agitated all the time, why I was, you know, because it wasn't really something that I was happy about. And I knew it was a, a way that. I could try to work through it. So I just decided to um, do everything that I could to figure out what was going on. It was more so the what um, than anything, because I didn't know what was going on with my with with my body and with my mind. And I just kind of wanted it to to get resolved, honestly. Mm -hmm. And just being honest, I mean, you were you are very successful. Um, You were very popular social media wise. I mean, you got tens of thousands of followers. Every time I see you, people are running to you. So was that at the same time that you were, you know, a public? Yeah, you, you had you was know, that the, the same time or different? The two go hand in hand. And, you know, when when people see um, people like, you know, I'll use Whitney Houston, for example, or mm-hmm. Prince or, you know, Michael Jackson or some of the, 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 the stars that we have lost. Um you know, I, I think a lot of that can be con- contributed to the fact that when you're in front of an audience, you have to put on a certain face, right? Mm-hmm. You have to put on a, a smile. And, you know, if you're a celebrity or if you're a public figure or if you're an influencer, mm-hmm. your fans don't, you know, they don't care about you if you frown and they don't care about you if you're having a bad day. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I had to learn how to juggle those two lives, right? So I went probably 20 years without knowing how to be my true and authentic self. Wow. Um, without knowing how to let someone know when I wasn't having a great day. Yeah. Uh, for me, it just turned out, honestly, to, to, to for me kind of taking it out sometimes when the people who were closest to me, they, mm-hmm. they would be the ones who would get it because I can't mistreat fans or I can't be rude to fans. So mm-hmm. it would come out for me like my anger and my, 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 my disappointment and things would kind of come out around the house or it would come out um, with coworkers, and I just had to figure out a way to 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 get out of that, and that didn't come until I got out of radio, and that's when I really realized that you know I've been living basically living a lie for the last twenty years because you know in in front of a camera or, or, or behind the microphone I'm you know full of energy, happy, uh, ready to turn up, ready to do whatever. But when it come to being home, you know it was it was it was different. You know it was, it was different, right? Right. Leave me alone. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm off. Yeah. 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 Uh, Joseph, how, how did, how did you know? How did you know that you, something was it? It's been a long journey for me. Um, I was maybe like 10 years old and I, I was just always down, always down. And, um, I don't, I can't remember what happened because I, by all accounts, I was once a happy kid and then just poof, I was not. And it's just been an ongoing battle of, of riding a roller coaster, trying things, putting it off, crash, burn, get back to it, um, you know, do the things I need to do, crash, burn. And then just, you know, it's been just an ongoing struggle, really, of, you know, the constant quest of of what works for me. And what works this year may not work as well the next year, you know, because I'm I'm growing and learning and maturing. So it's just something always that I always have to stay on top of because I've learned if I don't, much like addiction, 
in my substance use issue, if I'm not staying on top of that and I get cocky and think I've got it figured out and I'm healed, that's when I'll end up repeating the same habits that led me down, you know, some, some dark roads. Did you, um, know first or did somebody say something to you first? I could feel it first. And, you know, I'm thankful for my mom because it's like I had, my dad was of the old, old school method of man up, get over it. Mm -hmm. And my mom was, no, nah, like this is more than just being lazy or not wanting to do something. This is severe depression, like total lack of like uh, control over it almost because it would get to the point where it'd be so debilitating. I could literally do nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, but, you know, I'm thankful that I had it. I noticed it myself, but also as someone that could advocate for me. Mm -hmm. that went up against the attitude of just get over it. And that's kind of was like the constant battle my whole life between the, you know, the talks I had with myself to dealing with it, mm -hmm. get over it. Now nah, you need to process this, get over it. Now nah, I need to process it. Mm -hmm. And just trying to make sure that I'm, I'm giving, you know, fire and energy to the right side of that and mm -hmm. carrying on that same message to my kids and my son too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, a lot of, uh, a lot of men struggle with, just the perception, Darrell, that if I got to see somebody, that means I, I'm not a man. You know what I mean? So when did you tap into, when did you know that you might have needed to get some help to process a couple of things? When did you know? I waited to the very last minute. And it's something that I've had to tell myself to quit doing. I, um, I had changed my eating habits. I wanted to eat cleaner, if you will. I wanted to eat healthier. And I changed my eating habits and my eating habits, the change in my eating habits resulted in a, what was called a vitamin B12 deficiency. So mm -hmm. it's a form of anemia called precocious anemia. I think that's the name. Um, but what the issue is when you, when you're deficient in vitamin B12, vitamin B12 is a vitamin that very much affects your energy levels and it affects your mood, your, mm -hmm. you know, your, your mental health in that way. When you're vitamin B12 deficient, I was, you're very depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no energy booster. There's no booster, period. So I'm very depressed, very exhausted. Um, my mind is everywhere. I couldn't focus, both depressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're on both sides of the scale and you're not really in control of anything. And this is your mm -hmm. mind we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm exhausted. And so... You know, I remember experiencing a lot of not only physical issues, mental issues, physical issues, but financial issues like in my household. Like I couldn't my house was in foreclosure because I didn't have the energy to work mm -hmm. to get up and go get it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and then it, it started transcending physically. You know, I would see physical results. Um my I would drop weight drastically like my normal walk around weight is like 210 215 mm -hmm. by the time I went to the hospital I was like 180 and it, wow. that confused me because you know my weight had started with a one since my age started with a one you know what I mean and it's been mm -hmm. a while like I got two kids you know what I mean yeah. one is 15 you see where yeah. I'm going with this so you know it was it was quite concerning and in 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 at the very end I was working at a facility with a lot of medical personnel. And um, I would ask people about, you know, my condition. And somebody said, go get a blood test. Just mm -hmm. see, what, see what your body's doing, go get a blood test. And I went and got a blood test and realized I had all these things that was wrong with my blood because there was no vitamin B12 in my blood. Mm -hmm. And when I finally broke down and went to the hospital mm -hmm. and had a blood transfusion, that's when they mm -hmm. told me, oh yeah, if you're vitamin B12 deficient, it's going to affect your mood. It's going to mm -hmm. affect this. It's, and that answered all my questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, relatives would come by for Thanksgiving. And after they would leave, they would all text my wife and say, yeah, Darrell, something's wrong. And we don't know what it is. And no one's coming to me in my face personally saying what's wrong with you. But mm -hmm. everybody knew something was wrong. And apparently amongst, you know, the women in my family, there was a prayer line, like a mm -hmm. prayer chant. Mm -hmm. that people are legitimately concerned about my physical health. Mm -hmm. And it all stems from what was happening to me, with me mentally as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. eventually I just broke down and went and got some help. 
So yours is physical that led to some mental, emotional. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I would ask you, um, Joseph, if you think about where you are in life now and you go back to whatever age, if you can recall where you first felt not like yourself, what would you say to that young man now? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Because um, kind of deal with it with my my youngest son and the oldest as well, both kind of going through some things. And so I have the opportunity to essentially tell my younger self those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, I had to catch myself. I found myself automatically saying the same things I was told. Uh, just get mm-hmm. over it, dust mm-hmm. it off, put some dirt on it, <laughs> get up and do some, you know. And I'm like, yo, why am I redoing this? Why yeah. am I doing the same thing? Yeah. And, when I realized that I made a commitment to my son that, Hey, I'll process my feelings. If you process yours, yeah, because he wouldn't talk about it. And I've got to accept some blame and not creating the safe space for him to be in the habit of feeling safe, talking about it. Mm-hmm. And, but, but that would be the biggest thing because so much of my trouble growing up stemmed from not knowing how to process my feelings in healthy ways or my anger in constructive ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, finding football help big time. But once that's over, what do you, you know what I mean? If if yeah. all you have is sports, you know, most of us don't have the luxury of going to the next levels of that yeah. sport. You know, so what do you do once the outlet's gone? Right. Yeah. You've got to, you know, but you've got to put another tool in that box, but really just to to take time to process what you feel. Don't be so quick to shove it down. You know, take time to to chew on it. Yeah. I say, you know, I've, I've learned in, in doing this work in my own life, um, a lot of guys that smile are not happy, um, mm. you know, for different reasons. I've seen married men who are lonely. Um, I've seen guys who have everything who feel like they have nothing on the inside. And so I think a, a big thing that I have just learned in my own life, my own walk, is that most of us are socialized to internalize. You know, we are coached we are nurtured to hold it in i always tell the story about the little boy and little girl and they both fall down same age you know the little girl gets nothing against i have daughters they get all the there's a magical lollipop that shows up dion there's a a fairy you know there's a whole and then the little boy there's a whole community of people who tell him brush it off you know put some dirt on it you know i give you something to cry about that whole line of thinking Mm -hmm. And it just continues. You know, when I play high school sports, if you play sports and you twist your ankle, your coach didn't say, you know, oh, my man, are you okay? They said, can you go? And your answer typically, if you want to play is, coach, I'm good. And so there's a there's a culture that has taught males to just kind of swallow the struggles or the injuries or the trauma that has hurt them. Um, One of my greatest accomplishments in my life, you know, as a father was to seek help. Um, There's a phrase that says, you cannot heal what you don't reveal. And when I realized I had to acknowledge that I wasn't feeling like myself, there were periods, Dion, that I would get opportunities that I physically didn't have the energy to return a call. And it wasn't because I physically couldn't do it. I emotionally was just burnt out. I was anxiety filled. I felt overwhelmed. Um, I just couldn't do it. And it hurt me because I'm, most of us like to make people smile and be happy, but it was troubling to me because it's like, I'm successful to some accounts. I'm happy doing what I love. But there was something that, like Dion said, I just couldn't figure out why I was napping and, you know, uh, snacking and, you know, trying my best to motivate myself and even doing my best efforts. It just didn't work. And so I, I throw this question to you, Darrell. You know, who was the first person 
that you felt safe enough to say something ain't right? And then why did you choose that person? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. First person I felt safe enough to say something isn't right to my wife. I can say that. Um, my wife and I have been married for 12 years this year, it have been, but we have been together for 17. Uh -huh. So she is someone that has seen me at my lowest even before my issues, and she's someone who's seen me at my highest. So she knew something was wrong, you know, before I was ready to admit it. And she would ask me, are you OK? She'd be the one asking me, are you OK? Are you OK? And my mindset was. It's just a tough time for me right now, but it's OK. I'll get through it. I'll get through it. And mentally speaking, I'm just thinking it's tough right now, uh -huh. but I'm going to get through it. And if I fix myself mentally, everything physically will it fall in line mm -hmm. and it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. And eventually I said, right, I think I'm just going to have to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, okay, cool. Let me get my things. I'm going to call, you know, mom-in-law, my mom, or her mom, my mom-in-law. We're going to have her sit with the, come over, sit with the kids. And I'm going to go with you to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was, she's never been one to judge. Um, mm -hmm. She's very much asking me, am I OK? And she knows that I was not OK even before I was ready to admit it. And she was just kind of around until I was ready to admit it. And then she was like, all right, cool. Now that you've admitted it, let's get mm -hmm. the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my wife created a very safe space for me. And she still kind of checks on me to this day. To this day, I have people that I check in with and I have mm -hmm. people that check in with me. And she's absolutely one of those people that check in with me, whether I want to be checked in with. Yeah. Or yeah, not. yeah. Yeah. So but like, I'm good. I'm yeah, good. Yeah. yeah and she's yeah, still yeah. like, you sure? Are you yeah, sure? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah I'm good. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. The wife is the best for that. Yeah. Joseph, you talked about um, previous experience with substances. Walk us into that whole journey and how you have fought and won. Uh, and I know it's a daily thing, but how you fought and overcome some challenges. Talk to us. Yeah, man, it's been uh, a hell of a road. Um, but you know what? It, the other the, Kind of to touch on what Darrell said as well, you know, the importance of getting that help is you find out that sometimes what you're feeling is symptoms of something else. Mm -hmm. Such was the case with my substance use, my addiction, which, you know, was almost half my life. You know, since my early teen years started with alcohol, weed, then pills, you know, shooting heroin and overdosing and everything else. But it was all because I couldn't deal with how I was feeling on the inside. It was mm -hmm. to get away from trauma that happened during childhood. Mm -hmm. It was to get away from you know, just everything that came with life, the anxiety I was feeling, the overwhelming sense of depression, the sadness, the brokenness, the emptiness, just just everything that I was feeling that I couldn't really go to anybody about or even say out loud. You know, I barely even would think about it, let alone speak it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that uh, my mom said, you know, the other day when we were talking was the hardest two hardest things for an addict is success and failure. Mm. And I started thinking about that and I've noticed that I have struggled even more so perhaps with success than with failure. Failure is like, okay, this is comfortable. This is what I know. This is great. Yeah. Right. Success has been real new to me. I've accomplished more in the last six years than I have in the last 30. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, you know, much like, the mental health aspect with the addiction it's just you know it's wild to go from dying to living to dying to living mm -hmm. and we we all go through different it looks different for everybody mm -hmm. for me it was literal death mm -hmm. others you may be laying there feeling like you're dying mm -hmm. and that's something i gotta be cognizant of because i in a second i could be right back to either place mm -hmm. feeling hopeless or high or high and hopeless mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But wow. Darrell said it's important to have people in your life you can check in with. 
like my, my wife's a big one and my mother without those two people and even my father now that I'm older and we've repaired our relationship mm-hmm. him and I have conversations about mental health mm-hmm. the same guy that spent years telling me that anxiety was just made up and it wasn't real yeah. <laughs> now is telling me about his anxiety and I'm like yeah I get it yeah and it's wild yeah it goes to show that you know things have came a long way yeah yeah it's a big big deal um Dion I'm gonna come to you with this question because I know we've talked before um you have a your oldest and she and um her mother you know you guys aren't together you're married happily married but you spent years you know working through that with your ex or your your daughter's mom I heard a guy say to me recently, he said he gets his daughter every two weeks and he said he goes through grief every two weeks because mm-hmm. he'd have mm-hmm. to take her back home to his you know, child's mother. And he went mm-hmm. through this roller coaster high of picking her up. And then it's like grief is lost. He'd lose that relationship. So how did that play out for you um, as a father whose daughter is now in college? But that journey, did it affect your mental health or not at all? Well, first of all, let me shout out my wife. Uh, hey, baby, I love you. Um, <laughs> I will be nothing without you. <laughs> uh, you know, all this day is coming you, up. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice if I got a little bit more than some socks, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> so, so listen, so for me, man, I think, you know, being a father at 23 years old, right. is when my daughter was born, I was 23 years old. Um, and being someone who was not willing to settle for anything less than what I thought I deserved, uh, or what my child deserved in terms of the amount of time that I would be able to spend with her. Uh, I fought and I fought very hard. Right. And there was nothing that I would not do, um, to fight for my baby, right? I'll I'll tell anybody the first six years of her life, uh, I was in family uh, family, um, court every summer, first six years. Um, But, you know, not knowing then what I know now is that thing, it weighs on you. And just, you know, having to stand in front of a judge and explain why you should be allowed to be a father, why you should be allowed to spend 50% 50% of the time with your child and then have a judge say, nah, hmm, I think maybe you should only get uh, every other weekend and then not even Christmas. You'll get the day after Christmas and then uh, you'll get a month in the summer and you'll be good with that. Uh, that that creates trauma, wow. right? And trauma that we a lot of times don't even think about. A lot of times we don't even think about the 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 effects that basically ripping a child from their the 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 arms of their father to say you can only see your child every two uh every second and fourth weekend of the month if it's if it's five weekends in the month then you're just out of luck right mm-hmm. um for me that hurt me so deeply and contributed honestly to a lot of the things that I was going through right mm-hmm. a lot of the depression a lot of the things that I experienced in my early 20s was due to the fact that I was not able to see my child Right. There, there's times like my daughter probably has memories of, you know, after that month in the summer um, was over with and I had to take her back to her mom. Like I would be in tears. Right. Because I knew that it would be a, a whole another two months. Right. Before I could see her again. A lot of times, mm-hmm. um, you know, my, in my situation, I, my daughter's mother went to the judge and said, your honor, I don't even think he should be allowed a month in the summer. And 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 the judge looked at her and said, well, ma'am, it's it's, it's his child. Like. You know, he can at least have a month in the summer. And unfortunately enough, at that young age, um, I was able to at least get that. Um, but it weighed on me a lot and it caused me a lot of um, a lot of hurt and a lot of pain that I wasn't at, you know, in my early 20s able to um, express. But I never stopped fighting. Right. No matter how depressed I was, no matter um, how sad I was, I would cry and and, and, and cry myself to sleep at night sometimes when I couldn't see my child. There was times when I couldn't talk to her on the phone. Mm-hmm. There were times when, you know, I thought that I was supposed to, you know, be able to be uh, in her life more than I was. And I, I I couldn't. Right. And, you know, I didn't have the tools in my tool belt, like Joseph was saying, to say, maybe I need to talk to a therapist now to kind of talk through these things, to help me through these things, to help me um, cope with these things. Because from from 23 until probably 
31, 32, maybe a little bit older than that. Um, it was just every other weekend, right? I want to say th- probably older than 33. Uh-huh. Um, it was just every other weekend. So, you know, and now just think about how that has impacted me when I when I when I reflect on all of the things that I missed out on. Right. We have my daughter and I have a great relationship. And, you know, that thing that she tells you, she can tell you, I told her how to tie a shoe. I told her how to do a uh, double digit multiplication and all of these great things. But there's still small things that I'm like, man, as I'm raising my son, um, I think about my daughter, like all of the small things, the day to day things that I could have missed out on, like eating, eat, having meals with her every night or having uh, to take her to the park or take her to school every single day. You know, those car rides to and from school, are, are they're priceless. Right. Uh-huh. Um, so I think about now and reflect on the things that I miss out on. And I have to kind of self-regulate myself to say, OK, well, you did the best you can with what you had. Right. I, I couldn't have done any more else. I did the best I can in the moment with what I had. But it definitely impacted me and it definitely hit me um, extremely hard. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about those car rides. I mean, um there's so many moments that are not weekends that matter uh, mm-hmm. to fathers. Um, not ho- not holidays either. Um, mm-hmm. One of my favorite memories with my kids is driving down 95 and we had a flat tire. And my wife wasn't with us. Me and my daughters, they were little and they were emotional. And I'm just like, I didn't know the answer, but I was like, listen, we good. There's a hotel right here. We're going to get in this pool. Meanwhile, they're in the pool, and I'm trying to process how am I going to get this resolved? But if you ask them today, that was 10 years. If you ask them today about memories, all the fun stuff we've done, Christmases and birthdays, they will typically mm-hmm. go back to something like that. And so, you know, I totally feel you on everything you said. I'm going to come to you, Darrell. If you look into the camera, and let's just say there's a person, who's about to start working with fathers tomorrow. They're newly hired and they're about to start working with fathers and they're working with guys who are going through it. You know, what advice would you give this new staff person when it comes to working with men who are going through child support, custody, visitation? Maybe he just got out of prison. Maybe he doesn't have a job. You know, maybe he hasn't seen his kids and he's trying to figure this thing out. What advice, what approach would you encourage them to take when it comes to connecting with this young man? First of all, in the simplest way, the simplest thing you can do is just encouraging, encourage that young man to keep showing up. Mm-hmm. Showing up is half the battle. I'll tell you that off top. Keep showing up. Um, Dion, the story he just told literally brought tears to my eyes because I'm, I'm listening to him fight because he kept showing up. It's depressing to have to go to court to fight for the right to be a dad, but you keep showing up. It's depressing to not get those, to know that it's going to be two months where I don't see my child. Uh It's going to be some tough parts. That's why showing up is so difficult, but you got to keep showing up. You got to keep, you got to keep showing up. Um, And so I commend you, Dion, for that. Um, showing up is at the battle. You're not going to have all the answers because you're dad. You're not, you're not God. You're dad. So you're not going to have all the answers. And that's okay. Sometimes just being there is enough. You know, the stories you were just t- talking about is just, you know, I'm, you're not going to take your kid to Disneyland every weekend, uh-huh. but sometimes taking them to school every morning uh-huh. means so much, uh-huh. you know. Um, I, one thing my children, when they were younger, used to love is when the, when there was a storm and the lights went out uh-huh. because it means we're going to make a pallet in a living room because there's no electricity. Uh-huh. So no one can really see and maneuver through the house. So we're going to make a pallet in the living room and watch movies on the computer until the battery goes dead or everybody uh-huh. falls asleep. <laughs> Whatever the case, I'm not, I'm not doing anything amazing because the circumstance exists, but I'm still there, I'm yeah. still showing up and I'm still present. That's half the battle. And I don't have any answers. I don't have any answers on how we're going to turn these lights back on. I don't know have any answers what we're going to do when the computer battery goes dead. I don't, I don't have that, but I'm here. And yeah. that's sometimes that's enough. Yeah. You know, everything else 
you know, everything else, as long as you keep working on it, it'll fall in place. But yeah. the biggest number one thing you have to do, show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's what I would continue to encourage. Everything else after that is probably going to get sort of intricate and sort of, you know, the, the answers will be sort of individual to that specific person, circumstance or situation. But yeah. the overall universal answer is show up. That's half yeah. the battle. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. Um, Joseph, I've heard the saying, and we might, people might disconnect when I make this next statement, Dion. So mm-hmm. y'all stay with me though. Stay with me though. <laughs> stay with me. I've heard this saying when I got married, um, happy wife, happy life. Y'all ever heard that saying before? Right. And sociologists and researchers have researched the meaning behind that. And it obviously means Whatever you do, man, make sure she's happy. The counter to that is that you kind of suffer in making that happen. So here's a question I want to ask you. How can fathers effectively manage the balance of happy wife, happy life and his own happiness? Does that make sense? Is there a way to do both? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's called Happy Spouse, Happy House. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. The remix, the yeah. remix. <laughs> that, that's what it is. Because if, if just one of us are good, it's like we back on that interstate with the flat tire. Yeah. It, we, we may get somewhere, it's going to be a bumpy ride, though. Yeah. Um, and, and I really found that out. Once I got away from, I've got to uphold these stereotypical roles and give others life at the death of my own, yeah. meaning I've got to be everything to everybody and nothing to myself, yeah. ultimately means at the end, I can be nothing to nobody. Yeah. Right? Because I'm eventually going to run dry. And that's what did happen in my life. But the beautiful thing that came out of it as I was going through my thing, in my moment of weakness, I found strength in my wife. Mm-hmm. In my wife's moments of weakness, she finds strength in me. Uh-huh. You know, ideally, every day, we'd both give 100%, 50-50, whatever. But, you know, in reality, it's more like 30-70, uh-huh. 20-80. It's like you're buying ground beef at the grocery store. <laughs> you know, but but that's, that's what it's like sometimes. Yeah, 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 I just yeah. pray, Lord, give me more of the days where I can be more than what she can, right? Yeah. Uh, just, you know, but... It's important to have that place a relationship to be there. Yeah, yeah. I think in in some relationships, you know, that 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 whole happy wife, happy life is a is a loud statement. But I love your reframe of happy house, happy spouse. Um, in my marriage, I've been married twenty six years. I've had to learn that I matter too. Of course, my wife matters and what she wants and all the things that my kids need matters, but I also need my time. I, I discovered fishing during COVID. And it was 30 years before I had fished and I went fishing with a couple guys and realized, okay, I don't have to answer the phone. I'm not on an email. I'm not in a meeting. This is true mindless behavior. And I found myself not only doing that, um, I was introduced to meditation um, during COVID, which I had never, I always prayed, but never meditated and didn't realize I needed it, you know, but this guy who introduced me to it, he equated it to a busy two-way street. And he said, you want to pause your mind enough that it's safe to cross that street. So, cause when you close your eyes to meditate, the traffic is still going, you know, you hear butterflies, or bees, you can hear traffic, you can hear sounds, but going deeper, at some point, the street clears and it allows you to go to a place that you get to kind of reset your mind. I didn't know the value of that. I've always been awakened. I've always got on my list, you know, get them dressed, you know, whatever, breakfast, get to school and you just repeat that thing. But when I think about COVID, for you, Dion, did COVID increase your awareness around your need for breaks and pauses or 
did it have no effect on your mental health? COVID didn't. COVID didn't affect my mental health because I had started in therapy literally right before COVID started. Mm -hmm. So fortunately enough for me, I was already building a relationship and building a rapport with my therapist um, pre COVID. So once COVID hit, she already knew me. She knew my intricacies and and kind of how I worked a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she helped what she helped me work through was like the feeling of 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 wanting to be outside and wanting to like get back to a sense of my normalcy, right? And she helped me understand that, you know, we have to we have to we we create the lives that we want. And a lot of times folks are running away and they're unhappy and they're chasing all of these things and they're drinking and they're uh 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 you know cheating on their on their spouse or they're involved in drugs and alcohol because they aren't happy at home right so if we can't find ourselves being happy at home then where can we be happy mm-hmm. so for me covid was kind of like you know once we got over the initial shock of you know this thing will last longer than 2 weeks right um <laughs> for me it was just kind of like oh well this is like this is the home that we created. So under any circumstances, I should be happy here. Like I have to, I have to figure out what works here and figure out the dynamics here and be present here. So when the world does open back up, I can be fully available to do the things at home in addition to doing what I need to do outside. Right. But not running to the things that are outside of my home because we spent two and a half years on lockdown. Uh-huh. And you know, a lot of a lot of couples divorced during that lockdown. A lot of relationships didn't make it. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Uh so fortunately you again? enough for me, <laughs> right. You still breathing again. <laughs> but fortunately <laughs> enough for me. Um, you know, and now now if I didn't start that therapy journey right before COVID happens, I don't know where I would have landed. But you know, God placed me with the therapist who I'm you know, I still see to this day, who just kind of helped me navigate those things and navigate those spaces. Uh in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there, um, before you made your first appointment, talk us through what you're thinking. You know, first appointment Mm -hmm. is coming up. I can tell you what I was thinking, but I want to hear, what were you thinking? The first time you, okay. okay. It's tomorrow at 12. I thought it was next Thursday at 12. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, for me, (laughs) so for me, I think my my therapy journey was a little bit different too, because I had to find the right therapist that worked for me. Yeah. So for me, it started off with um, trying to find a therapist for my daughter because my daughter was having some challenges Uh and, you know, kind of seeing her as a teenager and seeing her kind of not necessarily knowing how to navigate her own mental health as a parent that starts to weigh on you. So in the midst of that, and of course this was pre COVID in the midst of that, I, I wanted to start getting myself healthy so I could be a living example for her. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a little bit troubling to find the right therapist. I went through and, 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 you know, went through two therapists before I found the right one. And I think a lot of people, you know, they give up too soon. They say, Oh, well, this, you know, this person didn't, didn't work out. I didn't like what they said to me. I didn't like, and you know, everybody's not going to be a good fit, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, finding a therapist is honestly like finding somebody that you're in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. Like you have to find a good fit. This is somebody that you're going to pour your heart out to. This is somebody that you're going to, you know, they have, there has to be a rapport and a connection Mm -hmm. there. So, um, I was at a point once I finally found the, the therapist that I'm with now where I, my back was against the wall. So when, when, when it was like, you know, okay, well, I called her and she wasn't accepting any new patients at the time, but she a- just happened to answer the phone when I called and told me what, you know, she wasn't accepting new, any new patients, but she was like, well, tell me what's going on. Uh-huh. And I told her, man, and I broke down in tears as I'm, as I'm talking to her on the phone, it's just a consultation. Like this ain't, she ain't even paid for this. I'm just <laughs> on the phone, just, just boohoo crying, just, just telling her, <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> Oh Lord, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, my name, my birthday, I bust out in tears. So she said, "Okay, you know what? We need to bring you in because obviously you got some stuff going on. So we, yeah. I need to bring you in, officer." So it it was such a relief for me once I found somebody that I felt like I felt comfortable enough to speak to or to talk to about what was going on. Because as men, a lot of times we shut down and we close, you know, we close people out. And I just felt comfortable enough after that initial conversation. So when I came in her office for the first time, it was just like talking to my homegirl. Like it was like talking to, to a best friend. And it's been like that ever since. Mm, 
Mm. Darrell, when you think about the the stigma, I'm gonna use the word stigma. How do we overcome that when it comes to men asking for help? There's a people call men all kinds of things when they ask. When they, guys are lost, people get surprised. Mm. Like, dude, mm. you don't know where the mall is. It's like, I ain't from here. Right. The stigma associated with guys asking for help, how do we how do we overcome that? Well, we get over the stigma by actually talking about like guys like Dion and yourself who will admit to having having gonna get help and how it helps you, how it's improved your life. And then when you do that, it it, it makes it less embarrassing yeah if you will like right now the way Dion talked about it how he can he's talking about a moment where he was crying and he was yeah. in pain but we can laugh through that moment you know what i'm yeah. saying and I, you know being somebody who loves comedy i was once told that comedy is meant to take you to an uncomfortable place and make you laugh and it doesn't fix anything right yeah. but even though it's an uncomfortable place we can get through this place with the smile and then realize, okay, this isn't as bad yeah. as it's perceived to be. So when mm -hmm. Dion tells a story, we can laugh about it. Yeah. But then somebody else can see that story and say, okay, if he did it, maybe yeah. I can. When you tell your story, mm -hmm. if he did it, okay, maybe it's not that bad. Let's try yeah. it. And so I've, you know, I got a number of, of close affiliates who have talked about their experiences in therapy and will openly talk about them to me and not welcome the conversation because I'm yeah. thoroughly interested. You know, I'm thoroughly interested in how this experience, first of all, you're vulnerable enough to admit that you did it. And yeah. then I'm going to encourage you to talk about how it's helped you. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I'm, I'm thoroughly encouraging it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are telling these stories because it makes it, again, it's less embarrassing. It's yeah. it, it, the stigma gets removed once we as a collective community says, say, hey, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. It's so, um, you were smooth with all of that, but I swear sometimes it feels difficult, you know, because I've had conversations. Dion and I have been to lunch a couple different times, and it's no greater feeling, man. It's like you find somebody who, without judgment, is just, I get it, bro. And for some, it's not even helped me fix this. It's just, I hear you, bro. I get it. And a lot of people assume that some men want things fixed, and some do. But there's hundreds of men who each of us, I'm talking even to the audience, who are connected to men today, your husbands, your brothers, your sons, your uncles, your coworkers, who just want to be heard. They, they don't even want it fixed. They just want to be listened to. Um, one of my closest, closest partners was on the brink of divorce and tied to that was suicide. And he, out of all the people, he called me to have a conversation. And if you're looking at social media and the last time we talked, it was celebration. You know, brother was doing his thing. And in our conversation, he just shared that for so many years, he had been publicly happy, but personally sad. And he had several things that he walked me through that I can remember him being absent from. And I'm thinking nothing of it, but they were all tied to his drinking. Mm. And I just said to myself, hey, this is not your chance to talk. The only thing you need to do in this conversation is just listen to this brother. And I will never forget at the end of his conversation, we started at 6 p.m., 3 a.m. is when we finished. And most of that time, I did no talking. I did no talking. He just kept going deeper and deeper, like unpacking this thing. And at the end, I just said, here's what helped me. I said, I just need, I needed somebody to, to talk to. I said, I, I am honored that you called me. But I'd also say you should think about calling somebody else. So he struggled for a month making that call, Dion. It wasn't because he didn't, didn't want to make the call. He didn't know how to make the call. 
So I sent him a couple of resources and offered to do the call with him. But the mental Olympics that he went through for a month was all the stigmas, you know, you a man asking for help, all of this. He went to his session and he had a similar story to you, Dion. Should have been an hour. Y'all might have the same therapist. I don't know because he said this lady let him talk with. He went for two hours. <laughs> he went for two hours. And this brother is, you know, he's he's strong and physically imposing. He went for two hours and he said to me after he could not stop crying during this conversation. And so my deep belief from my own experience, and you just cemented it, Dion, is that a lot of brothers just want to be heard without judgment for one, but interruption, you know? And I think, as I think about the practitioner or the colleague who's listening to the session, you know, hearing Joseph and Darrell and Dion's story just gives me encouragement that there are things that we can do. Um, so I want to, I want to get ready to land this plane on a very high note. And so I'll start with you, Joseph. Today, you know, you, you're doing your thing, man. You're doing your thing. What brings you joy? What brings you joy? We talked about where we all were, but what brings you joy today? I've gotten a lot of joy doing the little things. I missed so much working every day, you know, 50, 60 hours a week, Monday through Friday, Saturdays, a lot of Sundays, the little things, getting the kids up at five in the morning, making them breakfast. I've gotten to experience over the last 13 months, a lot of things I missed out on for years. Um, but it's important to have things outside of the kids too. And it's really just walks outside of nature. I love being outside. Used to hate it all these years, but just being connected to the nature, my faith, you know, just seeing so much beauty in the world that we're surrounded by. It's easy to forget that beauty when we're going through the dark struggles inside our minds. Mm -hmm. Joy. Darrell, what brings you joy today? So I was once told that there are three types of confidence. Confidence that comes from material possessions, what you have, and when you don't have it anymore, that confidence is gone. Mm -hmm. Confidence that comes from what you do. Well, I think we talked about this earlier. If you play football, you play basketball, your confidence may come from that. When your playing days are over, yeah. what do you do? And that can yeah. be a you know the loss in confidence. And then there's a the confidence in just being who you are. Um, I came up, I came up playing basketball, and a lot of us idolized a lot of NBA ball players that we had never seen in real life. Uh -huh. Well, now I see my nine-year-old son running around my house stepping. I'm a I'm a brother of Five Baby Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And so he's YouTubed some of my college step shows and seen me stepping. <laughs> and so now he's running around stepping all over my house now which is hilarious to see it, but it also brings me a lot of joy because his role model isn't somebody who he doesn't see. Yeah. His role model isn't somebody who he, he just sees on the television screen. Uh -huh. His role model actually wakes up with him at 6.30 in the morning Love to it. get him dressed for school and, and those, and, and, you know, and, and take that ride to on the, in, the, in the car with him to school to step practice in the morning at his elementary school uh -huh. or help him get on the bus. Um, the idea that I know I've broken that cycle, that I didn't grow up with my dad, my wife didn't grow up with her dad, but we've broken that cycle in our household. It brings me an immense amount of joy. Love if it. That's the right word. Immense yeah, yeah, amount. Yeah. No, no, no. Solid, solid. Dion, joy. Well, I just want to I just want to ask Darrell real quick. Is he YouTubing it or did you sit him down and say, this is how your daddy used to do it back in the day? So, I, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. That's true. Very good, very good question. He showed me some of his steps. That Sit he did down, I said. School, and then I showed him what I used to do. And then he took what I used to do to his practice. Okay. And I was like, right. that a boy. That a boy. Okay, 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 okay. Do you okay. want okay. dinner or not? <laughs> <No>. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, Love for, it. for me, man, uh, I get joy out of, out of number one, out of conversations like this, man, just having a uh, fellowship with brothers who uh, I can be open and honest with. And, and, and like you said earlier, like with no judgment, 
I think that's important. I think we all need to create safe spaces. I don't think there are enough safe spaces for men. Uh, But, you know, these types of conversations bring me joy, even on my my worst of days, because I still struggle a lot of days. Um, But also my kids bring me joy. I know it's a recurring theme, but like these kids are so funny, man. Like Mm -hmm. my five-year-old is the funniest five-year-old I've ever met in my life. Like the boy, the boy is funny. Like, and I don't mean like, I mean, the boy is funny. Um, And and also just now seeing the fruits of my labor with the 18, almost 19-year-old um, you know, getting a random FaceTime from her and having like an hour conversation with her on FaceTime about music. And she's telling me what she's listening to. I'll tell you a quick story. I moved her out of her dorm uh, over the weekend and she was cleaning her dorm out. And she had her playlist and on her playlist, she had Biggie and she had SWV and she had like a lot of 90s R&B artists to the point where I'm like Mary J and I'm just in there like, you know, yeah. just. I'm I'm jamming this to the dress ain't I'm, heavy. Like, <laughs> I'm like, man, like somebody taught you good and somebody was me. Yeah. But those types of things bring me joy, man. Just watching these babies grow and watching them develop and then just actually, you know, planting the seed and then watering it and then just really being able to watch it grow, man. That brings me so much joy in my life. Love it, man. Love it. Well, I'm going to uh on behalf of the audience, um, just say thank you each. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Darrell. Uh, my hope, my prayer is that as we've had this conversation, that somebody's been encouraged. And I'll leave you with this challenge if you're watching. Um, if you know a male, whether it be a man, father, husband, brother, son, nephew, check on him. Mm-hmm. Check on him. Check on him. If you can manage judgment, Manage it as well without asking the second judgment filled question. Well, just check on them. Sometimes it's just checking on you. Just want to hear your voice. It's good to hear your voice. Check on them. A lot of men that you might be in company with just need checking on them. So with that, I'll say thank you guys for a wonderful conversation. And we'll see you later in the second. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Darrell. Thank you, Dion. Um, wonderful conversation. There's a lot of questions that have come into the chat. So in a few minutes that we have, I'm going to do a speed round of questions, but I just have to acknowledge both you guys, all three of you guys, your transparency, your bravery, but also just your hearts that we all felt through the screen. So let me go to the first question that we have in the chat box. And it's just, I'm going to open it up and whoever wants to answer it, I'll toss to you first, Dion. This says, can someone speak to the value of telling fathers the truth about themselves instead of wearing the mask and faking it? How would you respond to that? That's a great question. I think that, you know, in order to do that, there there's going to have to be a, a like a cultural shift almost that starts when our boys are babies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when when our boys fall down and hurt themselves, the first thing we tell them is to get up and, you know, don't don't act like they're hurt or shake it off or don't cry like a baby or. Um, I think we have to first be intentional about the way that we're raising um, these babies and let our, our young boys know that it is OK to show emotion. It is OK to um, uh, cry and it's OK to uh, to hurt and to be in pain and to let that pain sh- show. Right. Um, I think we're going to have to to do a better job of kind of retraining um generations to come because it's it's, it's going to be hard to tell a 40 to 42 year old man that you know it's okay for you to show your emotion when all of his life he's been taught that emotions are uh for women yeah. or and don't show emotions so it's going to take a lot of work i think it's going to take a lot of intentionality um and i think that starts at home that's that, that that starts with the people that you're closest to and you know if you have a trusted relationship with a man I think it's imperative that you let him know that, you know, it, you got 
down all of those things that you've been taught. And we have to change all of the things that you've been taught and change the structure uh, of what you've learned in terms of your emotion. Like we have to actually change the way that you think about emotions and um, you have to know that it's okay to show your emotions and to let others know what your emotions are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You had a quote you mentioned earlier today, and I want to give it to you. The same question. Can someone speak to the value of telling fathers the truth about themselves instead of wearing the mask and faking it? Powerful question. How would you respond? I would say we got to know that father has to know what he really wants. Do you want to be truthful or do you do want to be content? You know, do you want to just, you know, be okay and just kind of keep the peace? Or do you actually want to resolve what needs to be resolved? I think you said it in the, in the recording, you know, there's healing and revealing. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard James Baldwin, and forgive me if it's not verbatim, but I've heard James Baldwin say a quote in a similar way. Everything that's faced may not be fixed, but everything that's fixed has to be fixed. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So you just got to be honest about what you want. If you want to resolve this issue, then you're going to have to be truthful and, and, and really reveal yourself and remove the mask. But if you just want to be content, then that mask is going to be there just because you want everything to be OK, but not necessarily be fixed. That's mm. part of the reason it's there. You have to understand mm. what you really want in that matter. Mm. 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 I've got Joseph on the line and he's doing a, a wonderful job of being a dad and very involved. You're on mute too, Joseph. Um, one thing that I want to just toss at you while we have you is just thinking about this question. Um, can someone speak to the value of telling fathers the truth about themselves <clears throat> instead of wearing the mask and faking it? How, how, how would you respond to that question? Yeah, I think it's a combination of the wonderful things that Darrell and Dion already said. It's a mixture of we, we've got to look at what the old that we were taught, hey, you know, brush it off. You got to be this. You got to be that. I was talking to my wife today. It's like this is a new generation. Uh, we don't have to keep what we were taught. That, that we don't have to be beholden to it, right? If it work, throw it out, do something new. And so, like you said about it being generational and like what Darrell said, I mean, you, you've got to face it. That's what we have to do as leaders of our home leaders of our communities, we have to embrace and face it and confront it. And you can't find peace as a man or as a person, period, if you're not your true authentic self. You'll spend your life wandering, trying everything, flowing with the wind, um, you know, never really having that true sense that comes with the inner peace of, of knowing yourself. We have to encourage that and give the positive spaces where failures allowed, ex explorations allowed, create all these things for our kids. Yeah, I'm gonna throw out um, just one thought, you know, on the question because I think it's a really good question, and I'm gonna use a phrase, um, and I think it's an African proverb, and I'll, I'll I'll go here and come back, but it says, "You cannot correct me unless you're connected to me." Mm -hmm. So I would I would offer to this question. I think it's a wonderful question. Uh, when I meet guys or when I'm working with students, and I'm sure some of Kenny and, you know, um, Dion and some of the other practitioners in here, Lamar Henderson, you know, when they are actually working with guys, you might have a couple of observations off the bat. But in some ways, you can't offer those suggestions until you're connected to the guy. Um, there's a great reception when there's a connection. I'll give you a quick analogy, and then we'll go to this next question. But if I walked into your local favorite restaurant and the server said to me, boy, take your hat off. You know, I might have a, a different response if they don't know me. But if I walked into my granny's house and she said, boy, take your hat off. Same sentence. Y'all know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to take the hat off. And the only difference or the major difference is there's a connection, there's a relationship, there's a respect between the two in that second scenario. So I always suggest as you think about guys who you want to give some honest, real feedback. You know, after that bridge, that connection's been made, you know, it's a lot more palatable. But if you think on the first day, you say, pull your pants up or take your hat off or remove your earrings and you don't know the guy's name, I can promise you, you're going to have a problem on your hands uh, down the line. So let me switch to uh, another question. I'm going to throw this into you, Dion. What advice would you give dads who are <laughs> unable to see their kids due to estranged legal issues, substance abuse treatment, incarceration? What would you say to them when they feel discouraged? Um, the first thing that I always tell dads is that you have to. 
you have to understand that this 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 issue of 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 fighting for your kids because most times that's what it is it's a fight unfortunately it is something that is one of those things that you don't always see the results in the beginning you know like a like you don't always eat the fruit the day that you plant it right so if you are putting in the work if you are taking the mm-hmm. right steps towards seeing your child and doing the right things it's going to be hard mm-hmm. um but you have to continue to fight the good fight and and have faith um in what you're doing and know that the things that you're doing the things that you're putting in place are for the greater good and are for um the benefit of your child like i said my daughter is 19 now mm-hmm. i started fighting for her in the legal system when she was 6 months mm-hmm honestly didn't feel like I was getting some results um, or, 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 or I was able to see the result of my labor until the day I dropped her off at college. Right. <laughs> Imagine going 18 years mm-hmm. of not feeling like the work that you were putting in was, was showing you. <laughs> right. Um, it wasn't until I dropped her off at her dorm at college and I looked back and I, as I walked away with tears in my eyes, I really felt like, Everything that I did was worth it. Mm-hmm. The moment that I knew that all of the fighting, all of the legal fees, all of the, you know, going to court and doing all of those things, that was that was the moment that I said, All right, I get it now. This mm-hmm. is this is this is what I work so hard for. Mm-hmm. So my advice would be just to keep fighting, keep pushing, because um, you know, the results aren't gonna always show up the next day. Mm-hmm. They might not show up the next year. But when you have a child that you love and that you care about. Um, it's your, it's your duty, it's your responsibility to give it your all. And I'm a firm believer that the only thing that should separate a child from their parent or their father is death. There are mm-hmm. other excuse that should separate you from your children. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you got to keep pushing. Mm-hmm. Joseph, I'm going to toss it to you. Then I got one big question for you, Darrell. Um, how do you give a guy hope when it seems hopeless, Joseph? I mean, you'd work with dads every day. How do you give a guy hope when it seems hopeless? Well, like you said, the important part is establishing the connection. But what's great about this work is a lot of times we're able to use our personal experience mm-hmm. to give hope. So if I can see it, I can believe it. A lot of times that's how we operate. When I was hopeless and didn't know what to do and where to go, and I walked into a father organization, I, I came across guys that have lived it, walked it, touched it, tasted it, feel it. And so I was able to know, dang, these guys can do it and accomplish it. There's hope for me too. A lot of times you may come from a place where there's not a lot of hope around you and you may have to go to somewhere else like that to get it, but it's out there. And it's important that we are that for them because that's what they need and that's what they're looking for when they come to us as practitioners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, powerful. Um, Darrell, let me give you, we got a few seconds left. I want you to finish this sentence. Um, when a man is hurting, he just wants, and this is a general statement. You can personalize it or you can use just general, you know, experience. But when a man is hurting, he just wants fill in the blanks. Filling in that blank. And this is a dangerous place to be mm-hmm. filling in that, that blank is there is no universal answer. I okay. think what we've done in a society is sort of apply a generalized characteristic into an entire culture of men or entire gender of men. And the dangerous thing is that you have a tendency to treat men as if we're all the same. Mm -hmm. And it's so not true. So if you repeat the, repeat the statement, when a man is hurting. Let me give it to you this way. Uh, When I'm hurting, when I'm hurting, I just need. When I'm hurting, I just need space Mm -hmm. because I know myself. Mm -hmm. And that's a key factor. You have to know who you are. You know what I'm saying? I, I heard a, I had a friend of mine that made this quote. He said, you can lie to anybody in the world. You can lie to your friends. You can lie to your family. But the last thing, last person you need to lie to is the person in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Don't ever do that. Mm-hmm. So when I'm hurting personally, I know I need space mm-hmm. because when I'm hurting, I can get volatile. And that creates a lot of innocent bystanders. And I can blow up on people to have nothing to do with the situation mm-hmm. that caused me to hurt. But hurt people hurt people. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when I'm hurting and you approach me, then as if I, I can dangerously approach you. Mm-hmm. Now, that may be different for Dion. Mm-hmm. I, when I'm hurt, I might need space. Mm-hmm. When Dion's hurt, he may need consoling. Mm-hmm. When Joseph's hurt, 
he may just need a, a conversation. He may need validation. You know what I'm saying? I think what's very, very important is that we have to get to know men, each other on an individual basis, instead of applying a generalized characteristic to every man, because that's how we got here in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When a little boy falls, rub some dirt on it, and we'll mm -hmm. tell that to every little boy. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work for every little boy. Mm -hmm. That may have worked for me, but when Joseph fell at us a little boy, he may need some consoling and say, it's okay, I know you're hurt, but get up, do it again, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So I might need to rub some dirt on it. Joseph may need some encouragement. Mm -hmm. Dion may need some consoling and that'll make him do it again. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But we have to get to a space where we know each other and we know each other individually, as opposed to just a applying an, a, a very generalized characteristic to an entire culture. We have Love to get it. out of that space. Love it. Love it. Love it. We have about one minute left. I'll just share this and then I will toss to Dion and Joseph <laughs> Lee for the last word. But um, a very wise mentor of mine said everybody comes with a care label. And he made the analogy of when you buy clothing in the back, it says wash only in cold water, wash in hot water. Don't mix with other. And fathers all come with a care label. You don't wash everything the same way. And to your point, Darrell, you can't treat every father the same way. So I thought your words were very powerful. I want to close with Joseph and Dion, just giving us some of your magic for those to think about how they work with fathers moving forward, particularly as it relates to mental health. So Dion, Joseph, you guys got 30 seconds. Give us some magical or just your final thoughts. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, and I'll just say this in the midst of everything uh, for anyone who's watching in the midst of everything that we all have experienced over the last three years, I think it's always important to remember to take care of each other, take care of your kids, but in the midst of it all, take care of yourself. Mm. This conversation mm. is a testament to how and why uh, it is important to take care of ourselves because, you know, we can't pour from an empty cup. If we aren't taking care of ourselves as fathers, if the fathers that you work with aren't taking care of each other or taking care of themselves, I should say, um, they can't take care of anybody else. You got to put your ox oxygen mask on before you invite anybody else. So I'll close. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Joseph. And I'll echo that. I'll echo that. And, and work isn't therapy. And you have to take time to really pour it into yourself. You will get burned out, especially in this work. So I, I got to say it just like Dion did that important. Avoid burnout, pour it into yourself. That way you can give everyone who needs your best, the best version of you. Well, we're at the time, and I will say this. Um, hashtag therapy is good. Um, for those who have not tried it, um, it, it's a wonderful solution, one of many solutions to mental health, but for fathers, just encouraging them to do this. But I want to just do a dare. When I was a kid, they used to do a double dog dare. But I wouldn't, I would dare somebody who's listening today to text a man, father, your brother, your husband. I so appreciate you. Something along those lines. Um, what I've learned as a father myself and as a man, and even my own father, when he struggled his worst, um, one of the things that I recognize is that men need to be affirmed. And finding a way to do that because technology are giving us that opportunity now, just before now and Father's Day, between now and Father's Day, I just challenge you, I double dog dare you to send somebody, even somebody who you might have had a fractured relationship with, some of those magical words that just remind them that even y'all might not be on the same page or you could be in an amazing space. Um, I so appreciate you. I so appreciate you. And just watch what it does. Watch what it does. Just watch what it does. Um, this is all tied to healing and, of course, forgiveness. But in the space around Father's Day, I just would challenge you to give a guy that kind of deposit um, today, today.